We can't hear you. Melvin, we can't hear you. Now you can. Thank okay, you. this You're muted. this is the closest thing that I could come for a chalice. Yay! So <laughs> the reading that goes with it is uh, from the Reverend Eric Cherry. Uh, the chalice is lit in our hearts each time that we pray for vision, long for healing, forgive our enemies, comfort our neighbors, and prepare for justice's day. In its light, our hope and compassion are renewed, and the covenantal ties that bind each to all become clear. Now, by its sacred flame, the path before us is brightened. Love prepares the way. Harmony is in view. There is no east or west, no south or north, only the world to greet and bless with more light still. Amen. Thank you. Now we have to do a little musical chairs to get, let Margaret come in. Hold on. Yay. You're on. They can see you. Okay. They can see me, <laughs> but I can't see them. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, we can see you. Okay. This is uh, an excerpt from Amanda Gorman's poem, The Hill We Climb, that uh, she uh, gave at uh, President Biden's inauguration. When day comes, we ask ourselves, where can we find light in this never ending shade? The loss we carry, the sea we must wade. We brave the belly of the beast. We've learned that quiet isn't always peace and the norms and notions of what is just isn't always justice. And yet the dawn is ours before we knew it. Somehow we do it. Somehow we weathered and witnessed a nation that isn't broken, but simply unfinished. We the successors of a country in a time where a skinny black girl descended from slaves and raised by a single mother can dream of becoming president only to find herself reciting for one. And yes, we are far from polished, far from pristine, but that doesn't mean we are striving to form a union that is perfect. We are striving to forge our union with purpose, to compose a country committed to all cultures, colors, characters, and conditions of man. And so we lift our gaze, not to what stands between us, but what stands before us. We close the divide because we know to put our future first. We must put our differences aside. We lay down our arms so we can reach out our arms to one another. Thank you. We are building a new way. We are building a new way. We are building a new way, growing stronger every day. We are building a new way. We 
Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Vashon Island Unitarian Fellowship. My name is Tanya Roberts, and I am your service leader for today. We are a lay-led community, and we weave together contributions from our members and our friends. If you are new, you are, we are especially glad you are here. Please participate as you wish. Human connection and relationship are important parts of our community. We invite you to stay for conversation following the end of the service. We stand on the traditional homeland of the Squibobs, the swift water people who have lived here since they were removed in 1856. And they were moved to mostly the reservations of other Coast Salish nations. We honor that this land we live on remains significant to their descendants, especially in the Puyallup Nation, who have treaty rights in these waters. As we settle in for the service, we acknowledge that our, our congregation is committed to individual freedom of belief, welcomes diversity, seeks to promote a sense of community and fosters religion which enriches the spirit. Whoever you are, whomever you love, however you arrived here, you are welcome. This month, the Unitarian Church has a theme of called cultivating relationship. In this time of COVID, our options are limited for seeking out new relationships. But on Zoom, I heard Reverend Justin Almeida speak to the University Unitarian Church in Seattle and was moved by his eloquence and grace. And he willingly came to here to talk to us. So we have the pleasure of hearing Reverend Almeida speak about how our faith is reaching out to more fully embrace people of color. The title of his sermon is Moving Our Living Tradition into the eighth principle. Good morning, everyone. I really appreciate uh, being asked to be here with you all and for you calling me to worship uh, across the interwebs and Bashan Island. My hope is that in the near future, this can not only be online, but I can be there in person because I hear it's a beautiful, beautiful place to be. And hope is what we will all need in our work ahead. As I've experienced in this pandemic as a chaplain and spiritual care provider in our Puget Sound area hospitals, it is good and holy work. Work that also has been difficult and needed as our healthcare system and the human beings who are called into it struggle with adapting and adjusting to the new realities of pandemic life. This is also where chaplains like myself 
fill an important role in meeting the psycho-spiritual needs of patients, staff, and families. We don personal protective equipment, otherwise known as PPE, and go into patient rooms to deliver the rites and rituals of life and death. We hold up iPads for families to see and maybe speak with their loved ones since they can no longer be able to be at bedside due to quarantine restrictions. We gather clinicians together to hold space and decompress from long and costly shifts. We sit with parents, caregivers, children and friends in parking lots and waiting rooms, buffering the shock of tragic news. Chaplains are not therapists or psychologists, though we are trained in those techniques. We're more like psycho-spiritual paramedics, stabilizing the mind and the spirit in the midst of trauma and getting human beings through sometimes the most difficult day of their lives. Over the last 18 months, I have seen hospital policies change back and forth, and sometimes on the same day, responding to new data coming in from executives and medical professionals. Before the pandemic, the only time we ever wore masks was when patients had the risk of airborne infections. Now, we all wear them. Patients used to be able to receive visitors at bedside, and now they must be cleared ahead of time. At their best, the policies and culture of the hospital systems in which I work encourage the health and healing of everyone inside of them, except when they don't, because they're not perfect. In my experience, one of the more difficult and morally injurious tasks I've had to do is to tell a spouse, a partner, a child or a friend that they cannot be there when their loved one is dying because the risk of exposure is too great. And I've been cursed at, pleaded with, almost physically assaulted, an experience that many clinicians can speak to. We want to say yes. Yes, you can be at the bedside. And yet, we can't, except for sometimes. On those rare occasions, because every case is different, we and I have broken hospital policy because we could not say no. Like when a 40-year-old mother of two sons, 10 and 13, was dying. And we snuck in their partner and their children to the bedside because we had to. We, meaning me and the nurses and the doctors, had to weigh the letter of the law on quarantine restrictions against the spirit of what that law represented, which is the health and healing of everybody involved. We did our due diligence. And we got lucky. Infection did not spread. 18 months later, many of us now are challenging some of these hospital policies as new information comes in. We know more about the risks. And I've learned that blanket policies without room for exception quickly become harmful because human life and death is messy and complex. At best, the policies serve as a structure to make the best decisions we can in our mission to help and heal. And at worst, they are wielded like a club to force compliance regardless of the injury to self and to soul. I've noticed that in many institutions of human culture, these institutions function in the same way as the hospital. We have our rules and our laws, our mores and unspoken expectations about how we're going to be together. The greatest of which, in my opinion, are the covenants we create, which inspire us more fully into our humanity. One of these, I believe, is our own Declaration of Independence. The very beginning, we hold these truths to be self-evident 
that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. As much as it's quoted, this is not a law. This is a faith statement. I don't think it is an accident that the United States and its federal government in many ways function like a church. The declaration is also a covenant for community and accountability because we all know the framers could do better. At the time, many in the colonies did not have right to life, liberty, or happiness. Many were slaves. Many in power were slave owners. Still, they wrote the words and they made the promise. They formed a new nation, not so much in law or treaty, but in covenant. Because the final line in the declaration is this. And for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. This is not the quid pro quo of many legal documents. These words carried the weight of human connection, a promise that would be challenged through war and peace, and like many great works of humanity, would chafe and challenge all who encountered them because it reached for greater ideals than was reality and uncovered the shortcomings and the hypocrisy of its authors. The Declaration was not enough. The Articles of Confederation were not enough. Our nation in its diversity and complexity needed something that would hold us together. Therefore, the Constitution was drafted, and it too begins with a covenant. We the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this constitution for the United States of America. At the time of its ordination, we the people excluded many, slaves, servants, women, indigenous peoples, justice excluded many of the same. Tranquility, perhaps for the powerful, a common defense, which would seek to strip the land and culture from those who were here before the white man came. Welfare, for who? Did those blessings of liberty trickle down like voodoo economics? No, they did not. Yet our nation's constitution, like the Declaration and other similar documents, say the Ten Commandments, the Eightfold Path, the Beatitudes, the Five Pillars, became more than just what was written. Living documents with words that would always break out of the containers in which they were placed. We, the people, order, union, justice, tranquility, welfare, liberty, posterity, these are transcendental subjects of human being that cannot be controlled or held by a minority of interpreters. They are not signs. They are symbols for what could be. Signs are static. Stop with its red octagon and bold white letters is not a suggestion. And while I have been known to perpetuate a California stop, slowing down and making sure no police are looking, its command is clear. And for a good reason, in the emergency department at Harborview Medical Center, I know firsthand of the danger of not following signs. Yield, warning, do not enter, wrong way, no left turn. 
Our whole world is full of signs helping with navigation and structure, law and regulation. There is really no room for interpretation. However, there is room for challenge. Whites only is a sign which was challenged by the symbols contained in our constitution. A symbol theologically is an object which directs the human gaze to something greater than its reality. Its meaning can be debated and contested. It cannot be pinned down or captured through a sole interpretation. This is a symbol, our flaming chalice is a symbol It was created for a particular moment in time to help provide documentation for those fleeing Nazi persecution. And however, our flaming chalice has become more than just a passport stamp. We now see it as the light of faith, the flame of wisdom, the fire of commitment, the container of spirit. It transcends the static and the fist in the air that we see from so many these days. This too is a symbol which would overcome the limits and the signs of the time. Our declaration and constitution are symbols which transcend their original meanings and intentions. Their words can be challenged and new ways interpreted. And when the old words are not enough, new words can be added with the consent of the governed. Slavery can be abolished. People of color and women can have suffrage. Prohibitions against discrimination can be enacted. One of the reasons we say our constitution is a living document is because it can grow and change along with culture and society. Symbols never expire their capacity for interpretation. They will always overflow the narrow containers of belief. Our own Unitarian Universalist faith, following the covenantal tradition, replacing doctrine and dogma with seven principles and six sources, which help guide us in a relationship with each other and the world. These are our living documents. And like most living documents as symbols of faith, our principles were not perfect nor enough when they were first drafted. Here is the original wording of our principles as adopted in 1961 for the merger between the Universalists and the Unitarians. In accordance with these corporate purposes, the members of the Unitarian Universalist Association dedicated to the principles of a free faith unite in seeking to strengthen one another in free and disciplined search for truth as the foundation of our religious fellowship, to cherish and spread the universal truths taught by the great prophets and teachers of humanity in every age and tradition, immemorially summarized in the Judeo-Christian heritage as love of God and love to man. To affirm, defend, and promote the supreme worth of every human personality, the dignity of man, and the use of the democratic method in human relationships. To implement our vision of one world by striving for a world community founded on our ideals of brotherhood, justice, and peace to serve the needs of member churches and fellowships, to organize new churches and fellowships, and to extend and strengthen liberal religion. And finally, to encourage cooperation with men of goodwill in every land. How much has changed in our faith and our world from 1961 to 2021? Movements from within our faith led by women and other groups sought greater inclusion of openness. Man, as we, as we heard, and brotherhood were made gender neutral. Indigenous and earth-centered traditions were included. 
revised in 1985 and again amended in 1995, adding the principle where we covenant to affirm and promote respect for the interdependent web of all existence in which we are a part. All of this brings us to the current seven principles. 50 years have passed since the merger between the Unitarians and the Universalists, both Christian denominations that have since grown beyond their original creeds to form a more perfect union of pluralistic faith. We are truly come a long way in a short time. And once again, our denomination is considering adding to our principles because for many, the demands of the world rub up against our covenant and lay bare imperfections and shortcomings. An eighth principle has emerged to meet these challenges, covenanting to affirm and promote journeying towards spiritual wholeness by working to build a diverse multicultural beloved community by our actions, that accountably dismantle racism and other oppressions in ourselves and our institutions. Like in the past, we struggle as a community and as a faith on why and how to do this. There was tremendous pushback in 1980 when women fought to be included as equals in the wording of our faith. It took five years and numerous meetings and conversations to remove the word man, men, and brotherhood as a placeholder for all human beings. Therefore, it does not surprise me that we are having difficult and turbulent conversations around adopting this eighth principle. My hope and prayer is that our current principles and sources can hold us in the tension and relationship through the process. As I reflect on the eighth principle and the events preceding its creation, I see it as a natural evolution of our liberal living faith. Like other living traditions, the crises of the moment have caused our symbols to transcend their old meanings and take on new interpretations. Because the old meanings were not getting the job done. They had become signs to point at rather than symbols pointing to. And when religion becomes about signs, it loses its connection to the human spirit, to the source of life and love which calls us to transcendence. It becomes like a red octagon with white letters saying, stop. It becomes literal, fundamentalist, rules to follow rather than a road to freedom. I wonder how our own principles have become like stop signs, stifling creativity. Are they still opening us up to something new in the world? To me, our principles call me to reflect on how I may be a better partner and lover, sibling and parent, colleague, friend, minister, and chaplain. When I hear the proposed eighth principle, I do, I feel a fire inside of me, challenging me to dig deeper into my spirit and show up with a powerful love in a new way. At the end of the day, I feel accountable to myself and how I have loved working through the oppressions in myself and in my institutions. In this pandemic, I have been called to minister to all people, including the angry white conservative Christian with the MAGA hat, the neo-Nazi with white supremacist and white nationalist tattoos up and down their chest and arms. I've been called to minister to the gun lover, the border wall builder, the racist, the homophobe, the COVID denier, and what helps me through these moments comes out of our principles. And through them, I build relationship as I'm able to the point where a dying man with a very different ideology from myself trusts me enough to ask, will you stay 
and pray with me. And I can really reply, we are in this together. And when we move into that field beyond right doing and wrong doing, where ideas, language, even the phrase each other doesn't make any sense, perhaps we become fully human. Siblings and faith, at this time and place, we are being asked to consider how we may better live into our Unitarian Universalist values. Because our seven principles have not been enough to bend the arc of justice to the point where all people of goodwill are welcome and included in our congregations, communities, and the world. Events have exposed spiritual and moral cracks in our personal and institutional foundations. We are called to respond with love. Like many, and like with many covenants I've known in the past, I am being asked to consider now something new. My hospital needed new policies to respond to COVID. Our declaration needed a constitution to respond to the failure of the Articles of Confederation. Our constitution, our constitution needed further amendments to respond to abolition and suffrage. And our Unitarian Universalist principles are now tasked to respond to the challenges of climate crisis, prejudice, and systemic oppression, all of which are linked through intersectionality. To deal with one means to deal with them all. And I believe our eighth principle makes explicit what the first seven principles say implicitly about our covenant with each other and with the world that we are interwoven in a garment of human destiny, that what affects one directly affects all indirectly, that we cannot do this alone, that we need each other. And we remember that our principles are not signs. Our sources are not signs. There are transcendental symbols that overflow with meaning and love into the world, pointing the way to the beloved community. And when the powers and principalities of the world hold up their signs saying, stop, we answer with a symbol of our own. May our conversations and confrontations around the eighth principle be fruitful and lead to a deepening of relationship and understanding of each other. May our symbols lead us to deeper humanity and connection with the source of life and love. And may we remember that every day is a new gift to love and to serve. And may it be so. Amen. Thank you for your thoughtful and inspiring words. After the service, we will have a chance to ask questions and have further conversation with Reverend Almeida. Now let's take a moment to reflect on what we have just heard.
Ted will now lead us in a consideration of their joys and concerns. Tanya, did you want to say anything else before moving on to the, um, the no. Ted, Ted can go, can handle it. Oh, is Ted doing that? Okay, good. Yeah. Go good morning. Um, every Sunday of the week, except for one, we share with our caring and beloved community our donations for the month. One weekend a month, one Sunday a month, we share with another uh, nonprofit organization that shares our values. This, this week, we are sharing our donations or sending our donations to DRUM, which stands for Diverse and Revolutionary UU Multicultural Ministries. And they, the address is on the screen, and you can uh, send your donation for this week down to DRUM. They are a anti-racist collective ministry bringing ray, lay and religious professionals together to overcome racism through resistance and transform Unitarian Universalism through our multicultural experiences. This group developed from several older ministries, namely, namely the African-American UU ministries and Jubilee World Anti-Racism Change Trainings. DRUM has a growing membership of UU people of color from every district and region. As an all volunteer ministry, DRUM continues to lead efforts to fulfill the journey towards wholeness resolution, towards becoming an anti-racist, anti-oppressive, multicultural UUA, creating space for youth, young adult, and our families of color to heal collectively and steward an effective organization that develops new leadership and manages consistent communication with members. So they will very much appreciate any donations you can send them. Thank you. Is there anything else you needed to say here before we move on to the next piece, Ted? You're still on mute too, just making sure. No, no. no. okay. <laughs> Make sure I'm not cutting you off. <laughs> okay, hold on.
Margaret. Oh yeah. Hold on, I'm looking, where's Margaret and where are you? <laughs> okay. There you are, okay, good. <laughs> Should I go ahead? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay, <laughs> here I am. <laughs> okay. Uh, this is, uh, the closing words are another part of, uh, Amanda Gorman's poem, The Hill We Climb, which was uh, presented at uh, President Joe Biden's inaugural. One thing is certain, if we merge mercy with might and might with right, then love becomes our legacy and change our children's birthright. So let us leave behind a country better than the one we were left. With every breath from my, her, bronze pounded chest, we will raise this wounded world into a wondrous one. We will rise from the golden hills of the West. We will rise from the windswept Northeast where our forefathers first realized revolution. We will rise from the lake rimmed cities of the Midwestern states. We will rise from the sun baked South. We will rebuild, reconcile and recover. And from every known nook of our nation and every corner called our country, our people, diverse and beautiful, will emerge battered and beautiful. When day comes, we step out of the shade of flame unafraid. The new dawn balloons as we free it, for there is always light, if only we're brave enough to see it, if only we're brave enough to be it. And Melvin, you're gonna extinguish the chalice for us. A little musical chairs first. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> um. Sorry about that. A little problem with computer spare. Are you unmuted? Yeah. Yes. Okay. This closing is by Krista Taves. It is our work shared with each other in covenant that creates and sustains this beloved community. We extinguish this chalice, but its light lives on in the directions we have chosen today. The light of this faith lives on in us together, in our hearts, minds, bodies, and spirits. Amen, shalom, and blessed be. Thank you.